Well, welcome and thank you for joining us, everybody who's on the line with us. We're going to slowly admit uh, folks as we see them come in on the line. But this is our fifth and final session for the summer. Uh, we're planning for the fall, but for right now, this collaborative effort between the PTTTC and the MHTTC, we are offering you the option to share with us, be with us. Um, in regard to Native food as medicine, providing emotional resilient support for Native youth through the healing power of food. It's going to be about an hour and a half or so, but towards the end, um, our presenter, Dr. Quesada, will engage you with some questions and thoughtful reflections also, uh, probably throughout the session as well. So thank you for joining us. As you can see, looking at this map, uh, there are different communities served across the country. We are one of two national centers that serve a very unique population. We are the National American Indian Alaska Native Prevention Technology Transfer Center and Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, uh, specifically serving our Native youth and their families by way of prevention and intervention and providing options for successful outcomes. The National American Indian Alaska Native Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, as well as the Prevention Technology Transfer Center, is supported by a grant from SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And the content of this creation um, is that of the presenter, Dr. Kasaba, and the opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect the views or policies of SAMHSA, HHS, or our office. It's really important that you help us with this last session because this has been a, a series throughout the summer that we've provided for you all on Thursdays, that you can help us by providing your feedback. Um, shortly after this event today, you'll be given a follow-up email with the presentation slides, access to the recording, and then it's really important that you help us with your feedback in the GIPRA evaluation. It's like a post-event survey. And here on the screen, you see it two ways that you can access that. You have one of those fancy phones, you can do it with the QR code that you see on the right hand side of the picture. If not, you can utilize the hyperlink that's there. And we'll be posting that in the chat throughout the course of today's session in case you don't see it or don't access it right away. It's really important that you provide honest feedback because it helps our funders see the great job our presenters are doing the opportunities that we're providing for our native communities. And it's really important also to know that this cannot link, be linked directly back to you because it is anonymous. On the screen before you now, we have our land acknowledgement that was written by three of my colleagues, Ella Driscoll, Keely Driscoll, and Sean Baer. Although we are located at the University of Iowa, we also know that near our university, there is Meskwaki settlement. And so at this time, we'd like to acknowledge the land and pay respect to the indigenous nations whose homelands are forcibly taken over and inhabited, past and present. We want to honor the land itself and the people who have stewarded throughout the generations. Please read the next few paragraphs on your own. At this time, as we gather together across our country, serving Native communities, whether you're in Alaska, California, Colorado, Florida, or anywhere in between, we know that you're doing a great job helping our young people and their families continue to have successful lives. Putting on projects like this is not just the work of one person. I'm Dr. Allison Bays, and I serve as the PTTC Programs Coordinator, and I come from South Texas area with the Tapilam Koitika Nation. Um, alongside me today, I have on the line Parker Laney, our communications coordinator, who's going to be supporting us and hosting with us today. Thank you for joining us. He serves um, there in the office with our many projects and products and other things. Uh, in addition to him, we have our co-director, Teresa Brewington. We have Bethany Walzek, who's one of our graduate research assistants and Dara Jefferson, who's also a graduate, graduate research assistant. 
if you signed up way back when in June, you know that Dr. Casada has been sharing a lot of great information, focusing on our cultural connections to our native foods. As I said, this is our fifth and final session just for the summer, because we're gonna look at planning ahead for the fall. So if you're not on our listserv yet, please take the time today or tomorrow to sign up for our listservs. You can gain access to all of the opportunities that will be coming up the next several months for other sessions. But today we're gonna to look at how to apply a balanced way of eating and incorporating indigenous traditions into food. So it's really important that you help me welcome Dr. Vanessa Casada, who is Kickapoo and Jijimeka. Dr. Casada? Good afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Bays, and thank you to all of your team and SAMHSA for giving us this opportunity. And thank each and every one of you for joining me. Uh, for choosing to spend your time with me today. And I will share my screen. As we get started. It just started raining here. <laughs> Super thankful for the rain. It's been really dry here. Um, I'd love to know where folks are coming from. So feel free to, in the chat, um, share your name and your territory, your home territory. We will be having a breakout group close to the beginning. We'll be able to interact a little bit. So this is our final session. We're going out with a bank. My land acknowledgement is that I am coming to you from Yanawana. This is Kowiteko Estokna territory. And I am Kikapu on my dad's side. Now, those are my great grandparents there. They came over from Kuko uh, to take care of a ranch. And Chichimeca in Spanish on my mom's side. And the photo on the right hand side is a prayer run that we're doing in the Tsuki Pueblo farm which was a, is a beautiful farm that is cared for. It's hundreds of acres and it's cared for by seven people. And for me, that is a reminder of how much we can do uh, with just a few people and with good hearts, you know, that come together. So a quick overview for what we'll be reviewing today. Um, first of all, we're gonna talk about what is the exposome. And then we'll start to talk about native foods, uh, how they are saving our territories, the importance and ground a little bit, get to share. Our first breakout group will be sharing one of the uh, traditional foods in your area and how it relates to your territory. Next, we will talk about food and supplementation for the youth, three big areas that challenges that they have are ADD, ADHD, anxiety, and depression. So we're really going to hone in on these and see what are the supplements that are recommended, what are the ways to eat that are recommended for them, and then we're going to go into our indigenous food pantry. So looking at those supplements that are recommended, how can we eat our indigenous foods so we can get those, those same nutrients and vitamins and omega-3 fatty acids, all the things that we need to keep us healthy and to prevent and heal uh, some of these mental illnesses. And then lastly, it's up to us. So we'll close out with a little bit about how to preserve our native foods, uh, different organizations, other folks to connect with, uh, different resources and ways that you can connect and learn from other tribes as well uh, that have amazing resources online. And remember and celebrate us and who we are and the wonderful things. You'll get to connect again with each other to share about the wonderful food initiatives that you have in your territory. The exposome. So this is, the, this is a concept that's being shared now. It came to me through an amazing book called Inflamed. And this is it. Deep Medicine, the Anatomy of Injustice. It's written by uh, Rupa Myra and Raj Patel. 
And it's an incredible book that really links what we're feeling, all the inflammation in our bodies and how that's connected to colonialism, the roots of colonialism, uh, debt, and how that affects inflammation in our bodies, the system of capitalism and how debt fuels it. Um, I mean, it's really incredible. There's a lot in here. Um, and it goes through each of the body systems and it talks about different effects and different foods. And it specifically talks about the exposome because there's so many things that go into our health, right? Health is huge. So as we look at the top left, there's the personal. So these are the things, the diet, the physical activity, work, toxic chemicals, sleep, social, smoking. These are things that to a certain extent are within our grasp that we can change and, and move. Um, again, I say to a certain extent because there's a lot of things that we don't have access to. There's a lot of neighborhoods, a lot of uh, tribes that don't have access to healthy foods or traditional foods. Uh, there are folks that were, are, a lot of our people are working in high toxic environments, um, either to pick the foods uh, with lots of chemicals or to work cleaning houses or construction, all these, all these different areas. Um, and then, you know, sometimes we're working two and three jobs to be able to afford living in this system. And so we don't get as much sleep as we'd like to. So there's a lot of different factors that are happening. So that's for the personal. For the external on the right, that has more to do with our environment. So what does our environment look like? Is it urban? How much pollution is there in the air and the water? Uh, how many green spaces are there? You know, do we have parks? Do we have a uh, connection to our traditional territories, bison sanctuaries, et cetera? The noise, uh, the traffic, and the light, these all affect our health. And then lastly, the biological responses at the bottom. So this is what our, how our body responds. And the exposome is the way that they look at it is the, from the moment that you're in the womb to the moment that you transition into the spirit world. So all this entire time is what makes up your exposome. So they're starting to peel it apart and look at it. And we talked about the gut biome, microbiome in the first and second courses. And we talked about how 90% of our serotonin that uh, neurochemical that makes us happy, that keeps us in a, a better state of mind, that the feeling good and you know taking care of our pain, that that is 90% is made in our gut. So it's really important to keep that clear. Uh, gene expression, what are some of the things that we've inherited from our intergenerationally, whether it's trauma and or resilience. Uh, inflammation all over the body is highly related to stress. And so stress and inflammation work together. There's every single person that is living in this system is highly, highly stressed. Um, we have epigenetics and then we have uh, metabolomics. So that's a little bit about the metabolics and the genomics and how it's working in your body. The epigenetics is how, even though we're given the set of genes, it doesn't necessarily mean that that gene is gonna play out. It, it also depends on how we are interacting and taking care of ourselves and changing. We have the capacity to actually change our genes and heal uh, for the next generations. So I just wanted to briefly introduce this as we go into different, our foods and our healing and our health, that there's so many different factors and it's very complex, right? So there's a lot of factors to really take into account. Native foods save our territories. So this last week, I took a trip to one of our sacred places um, here at Yanawana. So Yanawana is our traditional territory here from what's known today as Austin, Texas to San Antonio, Texas. It's about an hour and a half drive uh, to and from and all along the way there's sacred springs. And so these sacred springs are in San Marcos and we have our own uh, variety of wild rice that's there and there were some biologists that came by and they were um, taking out the invasive species non-native species in the river and they shared they were like you know the only reason why this river is flowing right now is because of the wild rice and that really made a mark on me and i i made a big deal about it raining because it's literally rained here three times in the past four or five months. And so many of our rivers 
are dry, like completely dry, no water, no surface groundwater. And so what I've seen from native species and plants and these, although they're, they're known as wild rice, they're actually closer related to grasses. And the native grasses, if you look at their roots, they're much longer. So they go uh, much deeper into the ground or in this case in the water, right? And they provide protection uh, for the water and for lots of animals and the fish and the, you know, the salamanders, we have a salamander there. Um, and so it's really incredible how it works with the pH and all of these amazing factors that I'm only beginning to scratch the surface of and understand of how our native foods are the reason why we have water in this river. And so it's, this is just the importance of the call that each of us are receiving in our own territories to really step into this work to protect our native foods and to ensure that life continues not only for our territory, but also for this planet. So I just wanted to share about that much for now. And I would love for Parker to put us in small groups so you all can get to know each other, say hello, greet each other. And um, also share a little bit about any of the work that's being done on your territory to defend your native foods and how that's related to your ecosystem and to your people. I know the breakout rooms are never enough time and I saw that there were a few more people in some groups and less in others so apologize apologies for that. Would a couple more people like to share before we continue? I'll share. Um, okay, thanks. <laughs> My name is Bridget Valenzuela. I'm with the Pasquayaki tribe in Guadalupe, Arizona. And our, our group, we had three. Um, one was one, the gentleman, Josh, is from Alaska, and he had a he didn't get a whole lot of time, but he was sharing how they're they're um, trying to fend off the coal mines, a coal mine, because I guess something about water, uh, the river, and um, our other person. I didn't grab her name. I don't see her name on the screen here, but she's in um, California, um, and all three of us had mentioned things that we're trying to. Um, we're battling with our efforts, you know, coal mines, mining, industry, and for her, it's um, the land in terms of having commerce creep into where she's where they're at with um, storage docks in the Riverside area. And then for for me in our our desert here, um, we did plant a big. You know, we did three sisters, um, Yoema blue corn, Yaki blue corn, and gourds. And we um, didn't have a whole lot of luck this summer because the temperatures are super brutal here. So the water, you know, we just, everything just kind of dried up because of the weather. It, it's, it was hot. It was a hot summer, really hot. So that's kind of the extent of where we got. Thank you for sharing. Well, Lana, I saw that you had unmuted earlier. Would you like to also share? Hi, my name is Lulena. Um, I don't know if you can hear me, but um, I'm Kokopo, and that is the very southwest corner of um, Arizona. Um, where my reservation is, it's less than a mile from the border. And with the border wall um, right there, we only have like a little section of it. Um, our tribal seal is of a spearman, a spear fisherman. So our main diet wow. consisted of, of fish. Um, but due to the border, we don't really have access to our river. And we don't really have a lot of land um, currently. It's probably about four miles altogether. 
and um, but there, we are making efforts to um, garden and and use what little resources we have. <laughs> so fish and squash are our main um, source of diet. Thank you all for sharing. I really just want to honor, you know, community wisdom. There's so much that each of us are going through in our own territories, um, the struggles of, of coal mines. Josh mentioned it in the chat as well. Coal mines, pebble mines, protecting our rivers, all of the contamination of our rivers and lakes and streams and the disappearing of the water as well. Um, and the elders are like, you know, the water doesn't disappear. It just, they've, they've said it just goes farther underground, you know, and that it's our responsibility to care for these waters. And, um, but Bridget, I, I definitely hear you about the coal mines, like that can really affect the soil and the water and everything and the contamination, the heavy metals, um, my friends that have gotten arthritis as young people, you know, from these kinds of major destruction that's happening in our territories. And so I uh, thank you all for sharing, you know, how, how things are going in your territory. And it's real, it's real. We, we're up against a lot. And I really want to highlight some of the small things that we can do in ways to, that we can eat and that ways we can support uh, our youth to be healthy and different areas that they can support uh, the healing of ADHD, the reversal of uh, depression and anxiety. And, you know, there's a lot at, towards the end, I do talk a lot about, I, I talk about the environment and aligning with some of these bigger organizations that have grants that have anti-mining grants, uh, things that can really on the ground help your territory uh, because it's not just about growing the food anymore. It's also about like, defending the, your territory and all of life that is within it, right? So uh, thank you all for, for your shares. I'm going to continue with our presentation. And if things like come up for folks, feel free to put it in the chat. I was really happy to see the widespread of folks that are here uh, from so many different places and also doing different things, interacting with the youth. Thank you for all of y'all's work, all of the ways that you care for your people. I'm going to start here with this book that was written by Dr. Danielle Amen, and it is called The End of Mental Illness. And so this book really goes through, as a physician, started to look at, at mental health in a different way and just say, hey, you know, it's not just about looking at these symptoms and then diagnosing it as illness. There's so many other things that can predispose folks to, to mental health uh, illnesses. And so he wrote this acronym of Bright Minds. And so there's a lot of information on these slides. So I just, I don't want to overwhelm y'all. I want y'all to feel spacious and good about being able to look at this and know that all of this is going to be emailed to you. Uh, a copy of this presentation in addition to everything that's written on these slides because they're a little bit dense. We're going out with a bang this time. <laughs> We're doing a lot, uh, doing the most right now. Um, bright minds. So B is for blood flow. The blood literally flowing in your brain. Um, is the blood able to get to your brain? Is there sufficient flow? Retirement and aging. Um, obviously that's not necessarily for youth, but um, it can be for their parents or their elders or their caretakers. Um, as we go into retirement and we're using our brain less, our brain is a muscle that we have to continue to use and uh, exercise. And so uh, that can affect whether or not we have mental illness. Inflammation, of course, affects everything. Um, and we'll talk about those connections of how that's related to our mental health a little bit more as we get into the different uh, disease states. Genetics, again, this, these are the genetics. So in a lot of the studies, it talks about the youth and when they can be predisposed to something. So their parents or their, uh, their parents could have, or their elders, you know, their grandparents could have had these diseases and, 
if they did, then that youth may be more susceptible to getting that. And if they didn't, they have a little bit more wiggle room, right? So they don't have to be as careful about getting depression, for example, or anxiety. Um, and again, if you talk to the elders, if you go back far enough, none of us had any of these diseases, right? And so um, this is something that, that in the medical field and allopathic medicine is important. And we'll be talking a little bit about inside the system, outside the system, and we'll, we'll be looking, I like to, to move like that and see, um, and just remind us of, of our systems as well, right? The ways that we, we know um, how healing works. Head trauma is another one. Uh, if you have head trauma, if you've had been in a car accident or you have some major head trauma, um, that could affect you being more likely to get a mental illness. Toxins, we talk about these mines and the fracking and there's so many different things that are happening, the pebble, um, the pebble mines. And so what are these toxins doing to our body? They can actually predispose us to some of these um, mental health diseases. Mind storms, that's when your mind just goes and goes and goes and, and who can relate to this, you know? <laughs> these are workable. They're workable for folks. And we're gonna talk about how, especially for the youth, how we can work with them. Immunities and infections. Um, when we're stressed out, our immunity, if more stress means less immunity, our immunity system isn't able to function as well when we're in high stress situations. If we have an infection, then our body is working to, to focus on that infection and our sugar, our sugars inside of our body will also increase. And so when our sugars are high, that can also affect our ability uh, to be more susceptible to mental illness. Uh, neurohormone issues, that more has to do with like thyroid and hormones and how does this affect, because thyroid directly affects depression, for example. So if you have hypothyroid where your thyroid is working lower than it should be, then that can appear to be depression. You can have low energy, you can have a lot of the same symptoms as depression, but it's actually just the thyroid that needs to be checked out. So there is a little checklist um, that, that folks would wanna look at before determining if it's a mental illness. And diabetes, so that's diabetes and obesity put together. And allopathic medicine, it's that they usually run together, right? So the, the diabetes, the inability to process the sugar uh, because of the high levels of sugar for so long, the obesity from the processed foods, you know, all of those things can predispose us to mental illness. And lastly, sleep. So sleep, in addition to seeing if someone has a substance use disorder, those are the two things that we look at before in psychiatry, before we diagnose somebody. And so making sure that folks are able to sleep is super important and seeing and maximizing that sleep. Um, we had talked to in some of our earlier uh, sessions together that we need at least eight hours of sleep. And the chances of you needing le less than that is the same chances of you being struck by lightning. So these are things to really keep in mind and focus on as we are going through and seeing all the different ways to reverse and address AD ADD, ADHD, depression, and anxiety, specifically as it pertains to the youth. So ADD and ADHD reversal and supplementation. So this information is about how can we supplement youth that have already been diagnosed with ADD or ADHD. So according to, if you're looking at your allopathic, your medicine lens, uh, the first thing you wanna do is eliminate artificial dyes, preservatives and sweeteners. And I think in our third or fourth session, we really went in on artificial dye, red number 40, all the studies that are shown um, how California is trying to ban them because they have a link to ADD, ADHD. Uh, the preservatives and the sweeteners, everything that's fake, processed, all of that stuff is wreaking havoc in our body, uh, minimizing those processed foods or eliminating them as much as we can. Uh, 
the elimination diet is a good way to kind of see where, how foods affect you and your body. And uh, I'm going to talk about that in just a second. The major thing that stands out for ADD and ADHD is the higher protein, lower carbohydrate diet. And in our first and second sessions, we talked specifically about eating fat, protein, good fat, protein, and carbohydrates together in one meal. Uh, specifically for ADD, ADHD, you're having more of those sugar crashes. And so eating more protein, number one, the protein provides the building blocks of amino acids that need to produce uh, your neurotransmitters and for your healthy brain functioning. And so that's that's one thing that is directly helping the brain to function better when you have more protein. Uh, and number two, that protein we talked about lengthens the amount of time that the food that you're eating gets absorbed. So carbohydrates don't just like spike and come down. And then there's this whole long area of time where you're not, you're hungry. You don't, you start having these like weird negative thoughts and you don't know where, where it's coming from. And then all of a sudden you eat or you have some protein and all of a sudden you feel better and life is okay again. <laughs> so really being able to not only offer the youth protein like snacks, but also snacks that are high in protein that are healthy, preferably that are not processed. You know, do, are there any hunters in the area that could um, make jerky and provide that, you know, donation. I know in Alaska, their um, hospital system is more than, I think it's 64% is traditional foods. And a majority of those foods come from offerings. There are folks in the community that come and they offer the food. Um, and so there's a lot of different ways, a lot of mutual aid type um, ways of care, right? That our people have always uh, done. And, and the ways that we've always cared for each other and given. Um, so being creative in our communities of how we can start to connect with folks that could provide and how important that is for our youth to be able to focus and to learn. Boosting exercise 30 minutes or more five times a week. Um, that's super important for, again, the, if they're unable to focus and their mind is going and, giving them some exercise 30 minutes, five times a week, at least specifically for ADHD um, can be helpful. Number one, to increase their sleep, to help them to sleep better. Uh, it's also an immediate antidepressant if that's also happening alongside. And then decreasing screen time. So we talked a little bit about the blue light in the first session, I believe, where we, uh, we can get some glasses for five or ten dollars, you know, online or find different ways. Some of the computers and the phones have a blue light blocker that like an app that you can download and it helps because that blue light is like you looking at noonday sun all day. So all the times that you're looking at your phone and your screen. And then lastly, at the bottom are listed the, the supplements that are recommended for ADD and ADHD. Again, before you start taking supplements, you would want to consult the physician or, you know, really double check the dose for the age and the weight of the person. Uh, but EPA and DHA are uh, omega-3s that are incredible for the omega-3s are just great brain food. They are so wonderful. And we'll talk about um, which of the foods qualify. And then we have the phosphatidyl serine. And that is, that's another supplement that is interesting to know. A majority of the medications that are out there of the chemical drugs that are out there are derived either from food or from plants, right? And so it's interesting to know that these were originally made from cow brain and now they're made from soy and from cabbage, except it's a higher concentration, right? And then and you're not getting the fiber and all the good things from the actual food. Uh, zinc is also recommended for adolescents. Um, there, a majority of the youth, uh, I forgot the percentage um, off the top of my head, but are zinc deficient. And so it's really wonderful. Zinc and magnesium are the two to really supplement um, for COVID, for so many different things, because they're vital to so many of the processes that your body is going through. Magnesium specifically, uh, 400 milligrams a day is really, really wonderful for 
uh, sleep and for rest and to allow those muscles for ADHD when you're, when they're going and they're going, or, you know, they're hyper, um, your muscles are kind of, you're tight, you're on all the time. And the magnesium, what it literally does, it allows those muscles to relax. It allows the muscles to relax and for them to rest in the evening time. So talking a little bit more about the elimination diet. The elimination diet that's recommended is basically to see if they have food allergies. So does this youth have food allergies that they don't know about? And the only way to find out is to take it out. <laughs> so you're eliminating sugars, gluten, dairy, corn, soy, and other allergy inducing foods. Um, as you can see, a majority of these are the only one that's actually traditional to this land is corn. And so all of the others are not. Um, most folks are, native folks uh, have allergy in general to gluten and dairy. Um, sugar shouldn't be consumed by anyone. <laughs> it, is, it just causes harm in the body, the processed sugar specifically, not traditional sugars. And in the first class, we talked about how the, the difference of sugar as processed sugar is 99.5% sugar, while traditional sugars have other aspects like fiber and water that allow it to be a complete and maple syrup has magnesium and it has all these other nutrients as well um, that allow it to be more healthy. Um, so in this sugar, it would be processed sugars, not necessarily like fruit or traditional sugars. So you would want to have at least three weeks without any of these foods. And then slowly you can add one at a time each week and see how your body reacts. Does your body start to get break out in rashes? Does your body, does your digestion all of a sudden stop uh, being regular? You know, all of these things, listening to our body and seeing how it affects us um, is really important for us to take that time. And sometimes we can do it with a, a friend as well. Um, I'm looking at the chat. So uh, Josh shares that moose jerky is amazing. It goes fast in the home and smoked salmon. That sounds delicious. So again, avoiding sugar, the processed sugar or keeping it to a minimum is highly recommended. Um, anxiety. So as we start to move into anxiety, the first thing we want to do medically is check for hypoglycemia. So again, looking at, is this person eating enough throughout the day? Are they eating enough food? Oftentimes we can get on our computer, even I'm guilty. I'll get on my computer or I'll get on my phone and I start working on something and anybody that gets on the internet, you know, you just, there's this piece of like disconnect that you're just like totally watching the internet and you lose track of what time it is whether you're hungry or not, like all of these things, there's these dopa, literally the dopamine receptors and the physiology in our body is changing because of the internet and the ways that we interact with the internet. And so being able to see first and foremost, if somebody's saying that they have anxiety, you know, are they eating enough? Uh, are their sugars going too low? Are they going long periods of time without eating? Are they on insulin? Um, are they taking some kind of diabetic medication and it's, it's too much, it's too high, um, you know, because when we, when our sugars go really low, we can get really anxious. We can start sweating. Um, that's something that happens when our sugar goes too low. Anemia is also something that a lot of our young, young people who uh, have moons struggle with, um, especially as a youth, um, being able to supplement the, their foods with iron rich foods, uh, dark leafy greens, things like that. Uh, but anemia can also show up as anxiety. That's how, if you don't have enough of the red blood cells circulating to get that oxygen to your brain, you can start to get these symptoms that look like anxiety. And then hyperthyroidism. So when our thyroid is too high and it's functioning, uh, at a higher rate, at a higher speed, everything in our body also speeds up. And so we start to feel this anxious feeling. So you'll start to notice common themes here of the recommendations, <laughs> eliminating artificial dyes, preservatives and sweeteners, elimination diet. Um, for anxiety specifically, it's more about allowing the youth some time to process. 
So we've done some youth circles here and we specifically have some time where we ask them to put their phone down, to join us. And we do a little bit of movement, five or 10 minutes of movement, stretching, breath work. So we're breathing. And one of the recommendations is to breathe from the belly. So there's three parts to our breath. One starts at our belly. Two is right here um, at our rib cage. And then the third is up here, the intercostal muscles that help us to breathe. So when we get anxious, when we have any asthma, um, these are the muscles that are overworking. And that breath is only getting to here. It's not going all the way down to the belly. And so when we can take some time together to do those deep belly breaths, that helps to slow things down in our body. It helps to cue the parasympathetic nervous system to start to calm us down a little bit and to eliminate negative thoughts. So automatic negative thoughts is what, what they're referred to in this book. Um, so these are oftentimes programs, right? They can be our caretaker's voice or somebody else's voice that always told us we were never enough or uh, the voice of the system, right? The colonizers that minimize like us, whatever it may be, um, these thoughts literally take effort to reprogram. And we have to give folks that opportunity to write gratitudes, um, especially the youth, writing some gratitudes, writing out, you know, positive messages about themselves, the ways that they think about themselves, hearing you as an educator or a therapist or a social worker, it's all kinds of folks on this call, um, being able to just reinforce them and not just tell them that they're wonderful and they're great and they're powerful and their indigenous brilliance, but also like embodying it and being able to do it for yourself too. And that they can see you modeling that is super important. And so one of the things about the youth too, when we get them in the, in the circle and we have them, so after we do the movement and the breath work, we have them lay down and we play some of our indigenous music, uh, the instruments, the flute, the clay flute, the wooden flute, and the water drum and we sing to them and we just sit with them while they rest and oftentimes not never fails uh, one or two will just stay asleep when we call everyone back up they're just out and they just need that sleep they're over they're just overworked their their nervous system you know it's unnatural for them to get up so early in the morning um if they have gone to bed so late you know and so they're by Thursday or Friday, you'll start to see that the young people just start to crash and they're just exhausted and they're tired. And so we usually see them on a Friday. <laughs> and so there'll be two people that stay asleep. Um, and on occasion, they'll, they'll also, they'll come back up and then they'll say, hey, I had a headache, you know, before this, or I was really, you know, not feeling well. And that 10 or 15 minutes of rest and relaxation helped them to get back to pain-free and feeling good, feeling more like themselves. The number one thing that they say is, I had no idea how much I needed this. So being able to make space for that in your classrooms or when you're working one-on-one -on -one with them is super, super important. Uh, the supplements that you could use for anxiety are all listed there. And you can see that um, sunflower seeds is one that's really accessible. You have to be careful with the salt though, right? <laughs> if you have high blood pressure, you don't want the salty ones, you want the regular. Sunflower seeds. So moving on to depression, checking for hypothyroidism. We talked about that already and how if our thyroid is functioning a little bit slower or at a lower rate, we can have those same symptoms that appear as depression, that lack of energy, that lack of drive, because um, we're really, we're, we don't have the energy. Um, weight gain, all of those things, maximizing our folate B12, vitamin D, homocysteine. So one of the things that a lot of folks come to the pharmacy looking for is uh, more energy, like something to give me more energy. And usually it comes in the form of vitamin B complex. And that can be really helpful. Um, checking the omega-3 index. Again, the omega-3 is brain food for our neurons. And that's the recommendation uh, for supplementation. Again, stopping processed foods, artificial dyes, sweeteners, elimination diet, you can see that that's 
across the board for everything and everybody. Um, and here in depression, it does also say increased protein and lower carbs. And the, the third part is adding the colorful vegetables. So that's a little bit different for the, for the depression. It's, that's where we're trying to infuse more of the vitamins. Those colorful vegetables are gonna be rich in those vitamins. And then eliminating the automatic negative thoughts. Intentionally listening to positive uh, music and messages and then exercise. Exercise and 24 hours can be an antidepressant. Exercise can help to reset the body, you know, get all of your neurotransmitters and your endorphins going. Um, it's really incredible to help us to reset and address uh, depression in the fastest way, um, fa even faster than any of these other supplements. Insomnia. So this is also something that is highly complained about or um, just highly affects the youth, right? And so there's a lot that goes into insomnia, but what are the things that we can do to support them? One, have them prioritize sleep. This is, tends to be a little bit uh, easier for if you're living with them or if you're a parent or guardian or caretaker. Uh, this is a routine to help folks wind down, right? And the things to avoid so that people are, so that you'll have a, a better chance of sleeping is caffeine, blue light, we already talked about that, noise, alcohol, and evening exercise. You don't wanna be exercising in the evening time, waking up your body when you're supposed to go to sleep. Um, alcohol also can interrupt your sleep, changes, does a lot, does damage to your liver, obviously. And, um, and so all of, all of those are the things you want to avoid if you're trying to address insomnia. Check for restless leg syndrome, sleep apnea, hyperthyroidism, low progesterone or chronic pain. Uh, some of these, uh, a lot of these things can be addressed through uh, food as well. Uh, specifically, there are progesterone rich foods. And for chronic pain, we talked about how folks, if you see somebody, especially young people that are going for the sugar, going for the sugar, going for the sugar, sugar can be uh, actually treating pain as well and it affects our mu receptors in the brain. And so we talked about that. And if you wanted to see that, it's more in the one of the first sessions. So blue light blockers, less electronics, prayer, meditation, sending your voice, anything connecting to the trees and to the land, um, connecting with other people. All of these things can help our nervous systems to re equilibrate and these are some of the things that were recommended of soothing music uh, or warm bath, cool room. If you, you'll tend to stay, stay asleep for longer if you, the room is a little bit cooler and it helps your body to um, stay asleep longer. Sometimes if it's hot, then you know, you'll wake up a little bit more. And lavender oil, uh, lavender is wonderful for relaxation. It's not a native plant, but um, it does help for relaxation, it helps for headaches, uh, any of those that it, it really helps to just relax the body in general. So other supplements that you can consider using, uh, there's the most evidence around melatonin. And we talked in the first and second session about how food can, how food can affect melatonin and melatonin affects serotonin. But Usually folks only need about one milligram to start and it's 30 minutes before bed. And you would take that each night uh, for 14 days. If you're gonna take it, take it for 14 days and then stop. This is not something that you wanna take you know, every day. These supplements are meant to be taken for 14 days at a time and not forever. <laughs> Magnesium, zinc, uh, those we talked about and 5-HTP GABA, we'll be talking a little bit more about those, but those are really, those are the building blocks for the hydroxytryptophan is a building block for your body to, to make serotonin. And then the GABA is overall used to relax your body. And so GABA really helps everything to relax. You'll know that some, some young people will be on gabapentin or um, 
medications to help to stimulate the GABA receptors, which help the body to relax for seizures specifically. Uh, valerian also has some been studied to have some good evidence behind it uh, for sleep and probiotics. Good, Jennifer likes the insomnia supplementation. Lacey had to leave early and looking forward. Thank you, Charmaine, for your, for your comments in the chat. So moving on to our indigenous pantry. So what are some of the things that we can have in our pantry that can be our go-tos that are nutrient dense that will help us to heal, transform, prevent mental illness, specifically for the youth. And so first, I'm going to go through and keep that same pattern that we've been reinforcing the protein, fat and carbohydrate that combination. It's incredible. Uh, I know that my mother in law has worked with folks as a personal trainer, and she's the only thing that she's changed for them is that they eat protein, fat and carbohydrate together at each meal, and that they've lost weight, you know, so this combination is really helpful for us to feel full and to eat. And it's also recommended that we eat more frequently. So we eat every four or five hours again. So we're not having those, that hypoglycemia, that, you know, anxiety like feeling from that drop in the sugars or being hungry. Um, and then that's when the youth start to have these ADHD and ADD type of um, symptoms, right? So we're quickly gonna go through a few of the big areas to, so that you can see what is it that's one thing that I can change or two things that I can do, you know, just to, to pinpoint how I can have and preserve for you and for the youth, uh, healthy, healthy brain activity. So for protein, our traditional proteins are pemmican, the wasna for the Lakota, um, jerky, we do deer jerky. My grandparents have done deer jerky, cutting it, cutting it very smooth, very thin, and flavoring it and you know drying it outside with a screen in a protected area. One of the biggest, like underrated nutrient, nutritious, nutrient dense, re uh, like a reinvigorating foods is bone broth. Bone broth. Uh, caldo de hueso in Spanish is incredibly, incredibly healthy. Um, it's health. It helps to preserve your gut to have that healthy, um, healthy movement and in your gut that healthy balance of the bacteria, good bacteria that you need. It helps to reduce inflammation. It enhances your rest. Um, it's an amazing snack. Like if you've been running all day and you're just like, oh my gosh, I didn't eat dinner or it's too late to eat dinner. Uh, I sip on a little bit of bone broth. And so in this picture, you can see a picture of these are bison bones. <laughs> They're very large and you can get the bones and just put uh, some butter on them and throw them into the oven and warm them up for a little while. It gives them a nice flavor. And then you can put that with everything else in this picture into a crock pot and let it sit overnight or an Instapot. And in the morning it's ready and you can have half of, you know, one cup of it and you are just loaded with nutrients. You can also add different plants to this bone broth. You can add nettles, you can add rosemary, um, you can add the traditional plants in your territory that are nutrient dense. Nettles specifically grow a lot of different places. They're antioxidant, anti-inflammatory. Um, and then there've been some rat studies that show that they could promote learning performance in the brain. So specifically help out the brain. I know them as being deeply nourishing as postpartum and vital for our menstrual health. And so again, when I can mineralize my body ahead of time, then I won't have the same menstrual symptoms of the cramps and the headaches and all of these things. Like all of that disappears when we have the proper 
minerals. And this can help so many of our young people, especially like all of the people that are menstruating, you know, could really benefit from this type of nutrition, bone broth, specifically with some nettles for that deep nourishment of our red blood cells. It helps promote oxygenation of the body. It's a powerful postpartum food and it's accessible. You know, it's, you can drink it as you're you know, driving, driving folks, to, you're the kids to school or on your way somewhere. We don't always have that luxury of sitting down and eating together. And so this is something that you could make at the beginning of the week and then drink it throughout the week. Just store it in your mason jars and just have it uh, for whenever you, you need a little snack. Oh, and lastly, I wanted to also point out that um, Rayanne Madison of Postpartum Healing Lodge. Uh, she's up in the Midwest and I got uh, some of my bone broth recipes from her for postpartum and she's doing a course, uh, Food is Medicine on August 29th and, and September 1st. I saw there were a couple of birth workers on this call. So I wanted to highlight um, her and how, you know, these classes are super important for us recovering and starting to experiment in our own territory you know, what are the things in our territory that we can add uh, to make these nutrient dense and um, healthy for our people. Carbohydrates, the main carbohydrates that I'm lifting up are the sweet potatoes. Uh, one, because they're a little bit more accessible for folks. Um, they're, they are from this continent, uh, from South America. Uh, they may improve brain function. They have improved learning and memory in mice and they reduce inflammation and free radical damage. So that inflammation is predisposing us to more mental health and a lot of other things. <laughs> but this is, this is specifically focused on mental health. And so sweet potatoes are nutrient dense. They're incredible and they're delicious. So we crave a lot of that sweet that sweetness in our diet and that sweet that has also been uh, genetically modified into foods over the years, over the generations as well. So our bodies are used to it, you know? So that's also something that we don't wanna just take away all the sweets and just drop it. We have to be able to have something to help to take the place, right? And to help us still enjoy our foods and have that little, that sweetness and feel, it helps us to feel good, right? Wild rice, amaranth and quinoa, those are in different territories. The amaranth um, I'm growing here in our garden and that amaranth is really high dense nutrients, contains protein. So all of these contain protein as well. And uh, amaranth greens also contain beet complex, which you talked about could be really, is really helpful for uh, folks that are feeling like depression type symptoms, iron, uh, folate, again, that's incredibly helpful for menstruating folks and the vitamins and the magnesium. Uh, in that picture on the bottom left is a wild rice dish that I made. It's super simple. Um, it's wild rice. So first you cook the wild rice by itself and then you steam the sweet potatoes and then you mix them together and you toast pecans just for a few minutes. Just, you have to watch them and make sure because they'll uh, sueltan, they'll release an oil, right? And then it adds an incredible flavor. So then you just mix the three together. And then I add a little bit of butter uh, at the end just for flavor. Um, but you could, if you wanted to be traditional, do traditional way, you could do like <laughs> kidney fat or something, <laughs> right? And, um, and then it's, it's a balanced full protein. You have your carbohydrates um, and the kids love it. So this is my godson over here. He, he was coming to steal all of our food because he just like loved the sweet potatoes and the rice and the texture of it, right? It has some soft, some crunchy from the nuts. Um, so, you know, making your food fun is also, you know, part of, part of the, the journey, right? Of, of being able to enjoy what we're eating and enjoying, you know, our traditional foods in a way that um, are nourishing and making things diverse and different, right? Yucca flowers, I included them because um, there was also some, as our climates start to get warmer and warmer, uh, like Bridget was saying, 
that we're going to start leaning on certain foods. So yuca is something that stri survives and thrives in the desert, um, also nopales. But the yuca has these beautiful flowers that it gives a couple times a year. And these flowers, uh, we can, they're a little bit stringent, so you might want to soak them for a little, uh, with a little bit of water before you actually cook them. But I saute them. I add a little bit of um, oil and salt. I really don't do very much to them, just a little bit of garlic and they taste delicious. Fats, we've talked so much about good fats and how these fats literally, they are rebuilding our brain and our neurons. So the neurons have this myelin sheath around them that is fat and Salmon, fish, animal lard, avocado, nuts, seeds, all of these, all of these things will contain our omega-3s that we need, uh, things that are, are accessible or easy to grow, uh, sunflower seeds, you can see that they're rich in these fatty acids and all of these different, uh, different vitamins and minerals, including tryptophan, which is the building block that helps our body to produce more serotonin, which is known as like the happy chemical, the neurochemical that helps us stabilize our moods. Pumpkin seeds are incredibly high in fiber and protein, and it's super worthy to note that even one handful is um, all the zinc that we need for the day, and that that can help us to enhance our memory through the hippocampus. So when they're studying for a test, they should have their handful of, of pumpkin seeds, right? So that they can remember what they're learning uh, so that they can do better on their, on their exams. Uh, purslane, the, the Latin name is Portulaca oleracea, and the uh, Lakota name is Ticapa Tejuta, or thick medicine. And these are also known, I knew them growing up as verdolagas. They are known as a weed. They are incredibly resilient. They grow in so many different places. I literally just harvested some from between some concrete slabs. It was just growing. I harvested it um, and I planted it in my backyard. And this is what it looks like. It has these little baby um, yellow flowers. This was a picture uh, from the garden and when the flowers are coming out just a couple of days ago. And you can see um, it's happy, it's succulent-like. It's a little bit thicker. Uh, it has a little bit of uh, like wateriness to it. It's really great for digestion and you can eat it raw. It has like a little bit of a lemony flavor, delicious. You can saute it. Um, add it to pestos or pickle it. Uh, Linda Black Elk has an incredible uh, Instagram account and you can follow her on lynda.black.elk. And in, on her account, she has the, um, the recipe for pickled verdolagas or purslane. Um, this grows all the way up into the Dakotas and all the way down into Mexico. And uh, there's just so many different ways to work with this food. It's delicious. And it's one of the few things that's not an animal product that is high in omega-3s that you could grow in your backyard. And they're thriving in hot environments right now. Like I said, it hasn't rained, but they're doing pretty well. Foods to eat. So in a lot of those supplement recommendations, we had GABA, magnesium, and zinc. And so I'm not gonna go through each and every one of these. I'm just gonna highlight a couple. Uh, for the GABA, for that relaxation of our nervous system. Sweet potatoes are amazing. Fermented foods uh, also as well. I mentioned some non-indigenous foods here. For magnesium, one cup of the prickly pears, the nopales, the cactus, they have a little fruit that's purple. And uh, that again, as we transition into these, this hotter climate and this heat, we need to really start to take care of these deep nourishing plants and, and plant them in our territories. Uh, know where to harvest them, wild harvest them. But it has, the tunas have 30% of the daily value that we need of our magnesium, which is incredible. Uh, zinc, uh, the turkey that we are eating um, is incredible for our zinc and some of the nuts and the eggs that we've already mentioned. So preservation. And it's really important that we are learning to preserve our own foods, our native foods, our traditional foods. 
we're figuring out how to keep them. You know, we didn't always have refrigerators, right? And so as we these climate catastrophes happen, um, we had a freeze here two years ago and, you know, the grid was just, we had no electricity uh, and half of the folks didn't have water. And so as we start to think about some of these challenges that we're facing, we need to prepare uh, and, and go with calmness, right? Prepare in a calm state so that we can um, have something to fall back on. So drying, dehydrating, freezing, canning, um, obviously the freezing you need electricity for, but the others um, you wouldn't need and the, the food can last for months and years. The Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium has this beautiful session. So we talked a little bit about the Alaskan hospital that has uh, traditional foods. They have this initiative on YouTube, it's called Store Outside Your Door, and you can YouTube it. And it talks about um, how to do each thing. How do you cut the salmon to dry it? And how is the salmon a first food that helps for the infant's teeth to come out and the texture? You know, and, and really has a lot of really beautiful information for folks that are reconnecting uh, to your traditional foods and really learning from other territories and, and other people that are um, that carry, you know, not all of our tribes carry all of these uh, teachings. And so we're having to piece things together from different elders and sometimes different tribes as well. American Indian food producers. So if you're at that point where you're like, yes, I want to eat better, but where do I get my food from? Because it feels overwhelming to just start growing everything in my house. Um, the American Indian food producers have this website. And if you follow this website, it'll tell you in your area who are all the Native American producers of food so that you can support them, you can support indigenous business. Um, it's an incredible directory. I really loved it. Uh, and then just as everyone said at the beginning of the call, you know, protecting our environment so that we have clean water for our food to grow so that we are not eating these heavy metals and chemicals that we don't even can't even pronounce the names of. We really need to support and link into these organizations such as the Indigenous Environmental Network, Grassroots Global Justice Alliance, and the Climate Justice Alliance uh, for our just transition. Right now, there's a lot of talk around fossil fuels and transitioning away from fossil fuels onto renewable energy. What does that look like? How that will take place? Um, there was a bill that was just passed that is not in, in the government um, that is actually ceding a lot of territory, public land to oil and gas companies to, and we all know that that just means that they're gonna destroy and pollute even more. And so it's really important for us to at least get linked in, sign the petition, do what we can here and there. And, you know, as we're able to stand up for the waters in our territory, sometimes, you know, I, I really respect all of the, um, the folks that have really put their life on the line all over Abyayala from Alaska all the way to South America to protect their territories, because we know that by protecting our territories, it's really protecting life. Um, on this planet. And then lastly, this is, I'm just gonna take a few minutes to talk about this, the, the plants. So just as a reminder, you know, that we are, we have our own systems, our own ways. We don't have to follow all of allopathic medicine's rules. There are things that work for us in our community that are valid, right? So. Linda Black Elk talks about a few things like the hawthorn flower, the linden flower. Um, this is pineapple weed. I'll have to move that so you can see it, but the wild chamomile. And there's a picture on the right of the wild chamomile, what that looks like in our territory. Um, dried, we use it so much, mainly for anxiety and insomnia. It also helps to move the stomach. And so a lot for us, for curandismo teachings, it's the stomach stores a lot of our emotion. And so when we can move that, when we can relax that, then it allows our whole body to relax. It helps us to process some of these emotions that can get stuck. Um, passion flower is incredible for addiction and also for insomnia. Um, 
find those aunties or that family that you can see go get a clipping from and start it at your house or that they have the green thumb and you know just go harvest it from them doing a little exchange with them sit with them hear their stories um, our healing and cultura collective we do a valerian root valerian's non-native but it has been it grows really well here and it's been incredible to help for sleep and also for anxiety it also helps to relax um, and and help folks that are transitioning into menopause to bring it down a notch as well and just helps overall anxiety and it's natural and it's not quite as intense as uh, some of the medications or the drugs. Make it manageable tea. We make a tea blend that's chamomile. Um, this one is the pineapple and the, the wild chamomile, the lemon balm, that's also non-native, but we grow it here. It's incredible for um, depression and for, it brings in the light, right? So it helps with mood, overall mood, makes you brighter. And then the oat tops, specifically will regrow your entire nervous system it regrows your neurons so those um those are really incredible to help the youth to restore their nervous system and then according to our to the curanderismo teachings and the trece aires there's um, ways to treat sadness and sorrow with rose petals which also could go under like anxiety and depression right uh, because it's a nervine, rose petals are a nervine that you can use in tea, it's anti-inflammatory, it's antidepressant, you get to see the colors, you get to interact, you get to smell it, there's so many beautiful aspects of roses and that are native to this land. The bougainvillea also can be used in teas and in baths, and again, this grief, this stored up grief and sadness and sorrow, it happens in it for it happens and it's stored in the lungs and the heart. So when we're able to open up, when we're able to use these plant medicines, uh, these allies to assist us to work through these things and we come together, we have that ability to heal each other. Um, and I've had some really powerful experiences with folks through baños, through having, um, doing baths with folks and having someone you know sing to you and you being able to like hold, be held you know, through some of these really difficult times in life is really important. Smudging, if folks, you know, are able to smudge in your classroom or with the youth, it just helps to reconnect that sense of smell that goes to our brainstem. That is, even if we're in a coma, we can still smell. It's one of our oldest senses and primal. And so this, the smudging is that memory. It helps to open up that memory and calm ourselves and uh, working with tree medicine to ground us and mushrooms uh, that also can have positive nerve and brain effects. Okay, we have a few minutes left. And I want to see if we have a few minutes to do another breakout to just share what's been working well in your community. What are some amazing things your tribe has achieved in terms of supporting your youth with mental health, with plant medicine, with foods? I wanna see if Parker could put us into those groups as soon as he's able, just for the last few minutes. Would you like for a group again? Yes, please. Just want to honor everyone's time. Thank you all for joining. Ophelia and Jenny, you're the only ones that have come back. But if you'd like to share, I'd love to hear from you. <laughs> I think Jenny had a question about um, indigenous foods. Um, and I just, you know, told her that, uh, well, I'm, I live in Arizona, Navajo, and right about this time, people are starting to sell their crops. So I just said, you know, basically it's up to the children, parent, I mean, up to the parents to reinforce, you know, culture and, and um, show them what foods um, we, you know, we usually eat right around this time. So, um, but what we eat is entirely different you know it, it it varies from tribe to tribe so 
That's what I offered. It's about 3.30. Thank you for sharing, Ophelia. And if anybody else wants to share, we will have time for one more person to share as we close up. Yeah, I just shared my contact information then. Uh, that's my email. There's a survey too as well. This is the, the last session for our five session across the summer. Um, if you liked what you heard or you wanna hear more about some of the things that were touched upon, uh, there, everything is recorded. Um, thank you so much for sharing about your community. Um, indigenous foods are different for everyone, depending on what territory you're in, what tribe you're from. Uh, you know, you may be in somebody else's territory as well and, and growing your foods. There's all kinds of complexities <laughs> and beauty ways that can coexist together <laughs> and learn from each other. Um, and that we have the power to rebuild our ecosystems. We have the power to have strong, clear youth that are not burdened by these chemicals, by uh, the burdens of colonization, by the system. Uh, they're ready to fly and they're ready to uh, take us to the next level and in this transitional time and just really thankful for each and every one of you, the work that you do with the youth. And I'm, I'm here for to speak and support anyone and share and learn from you all too. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.